Hey guys, uh, welcome to the chapter 15 lecture for AP World History on India and the Indian Ocean Basin. Uh, quick world roundup. So obviously we're going to be talking about India and the Indian Ocean Basin. Basin. Actually, let me hide myself for a second here um, just so you can see the trade routes a little bit better. But um, what we are going to be looking at in particular are... Um, obviously, India and this general area here realize that what we consider India today is not what was always considered India. India, for the most part throughout history until about 1949, is uh, India and the modern day countries of Pakistan and Bangladesh. But for most of history, what we consider India included those territories as well. But uh, when we talk about India, you always have to keep in mind that India is not like China, which has a single dynasty ruling a large territory with pretty firm control over things. And it's certainly not like Rome, which has a very firm infrastructure for a long time. India is kind of a series of mostly local empires trying to gain control over most of India with varying degrees of success. We'll see at certain points, for, uh, like in the um, Delhi Sultanate, where they're able to um, get control over most of that territory. Um, I'm slowly coming back here. The wheel is spinning. Um, but we see at other points they didn't really control anything at all, and most of India is pretty decentralized. So let's continue. I don't know if I'm ever going to come back. Okay, I'm back. Um, so... We begin there with a, sort of a quest for centralized rule, I'm beginning with the invasion of the White Huns from Central Asia, um, beginning in 451 in the Common Era. The White Huns are very similar to your sort of Mongol type people, um, predominantly nomadic, um, fought on horseback, which made them very mobile and very difficult for these more stable, um, sedentary agricultural states to defend against because they didn't operate in the same way. Let's get a bit of, better picture of them and get me out of there. There they are, um, operated on horseback, able to maneuver a bit more easily. But anyway, they conquered um, large portions of India and essentially precipitated the collapse of the Gupta state in the mid-6th century. Um, and with that brought a lot of chaos in northern India. Um, a lot of local rulers trying to take control over India and none of them essentially very successful until we have the invasion of Turkish nomads who of more or less get absorbed into Indian society, um, adopt their culture and a lot of their ways of doing things rather than sort of imposing their way of life on India. Um, with that, um, probably our most famous ruler um, who was able to restore most unification in North India was this mustachioed fellow, what a great stash, um, named King Arsha. Um, very tolerant Buddhist ruler, um, showed a lot of support and a lot of generosity towards the poor. It was a very cultured ruler. Um, he wrote plays, he was very keen on music and literature and gave a lot of patronage to the arts, um, poets, authors, all that sort of thing. Um, but he was not able to keep control over India as he was assassinated by power hungry local leaders who had other thoughts in mind. And there was no successor that was able to really retain control in India, so it kind of was ripe for the plucking. And that's where we introduce um, Arab Muslims who were not only sweeping through Europe and um, almost swept in, or sweeping through Northern Africa and almost swept into Europe, if it not been for the battle at Tours and Charles Martel and the Gauls, Franks, um, able to push them back. But they are also pushing west. And as we established in chapter 14, they took over Palestine, aka the Levant. They took over Mesopotamia. They took over Persia. And they would push into the Sindh area, which is northwest India. Truth be told, the only place you can really take over India is from the northwest. That's really the only area. You can't really do it from the north 
through the Northeast because you have the Himalayas in the way, and those are nearly impossible to pass, especially with an army. And attacking by sea, of course, is very, very difficult at this time. The ships are not really built for that sort of thing. And we won't see that really occur until the British would do it uh, much later on in the 18th century. But that was a rather extensive process in and of itself. But Arabs were essentially able to conquer India under the uh, banner of the Abbasid dynasty, which is... Um, Interesting, considering that the Abbasids weren't really interested in conquest, but they kind of held what the Umayyads had already taken over, and they were able to maintain a slight bit of control. But when we see it wasn't really that firm, their control over India. Um, so the way that they get in there, and I'll lose myself for a second here, um, was more than anything else, it was through the arrival of merchants. Um, merchants who had been traveling all throughout the Middle East, all throughout Northern Africa, even into Europe, into Anatolia, um, all these places. They also made their way into India because as we may remember from our Silk Road study, India was a key piece in that they provided certain rich um goods like especially spices because remember spices don't really go bad and also cotton as well um, but especially spices spices from india especially things like pepper became very 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 popular um we kind of take pepper for granted because everybody had it but back then pepper was huge because it added a lot of spice to your diet variety is the spice of life and it's definitely the spice of food too and you don't want to eat the same bland salty food all the time so the Arab merchants who were able to work within India eventually stayed and introduced their religion as well um, within India. They also established a lot of port communities um, along the coast of the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, and they were really the pushers of trade um, between India and their Western neighbors into the 15th century. Um, and that's where we um, learn about our guy, Mahmoud of Ghazni. Um, he was the leader of the Turks in Afghanistan, and he was one of the leading raiders into India. And he was a pretty destructive guy, um, but, <coughs> excuse me, also very eloquent in a way. He burned down temples, destroyed places of learning, but yet he was very tolerant of, of Hindu and Buddhists and was, you know, as long as you submitted to his authority, he didn't really bother you too much. Um, and he destroyed the Samnath uh, Hindu temple of Gujarat in 1025, but he also very much like was seen as an elegant leader, uh, but very, 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 very brutal in a lot of ways too. So he's like many leaders, a very complex leader. Um, here we see him displaying his silk robes for some of his Turkish superiors. One of the nice things when you're a king is that everybody has to like what you do no matter what. So if you get some sick new clothes, people have to say, oh, wow, those are some great clothes. Those are awesome. They're great. Wow. So cool. No matter what, even if they don't look that good. But I digress. Um, so here we have... Um, sort of the Sultanate of Delhi, um, Sultanate implying a Muslim leadership, um, first made up of Mahmud's raiding territory. He was under the control of the Abbasid um, Caliphate, but they didn't really have much control over him. And though he had to answer to the sultans of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate, he kind of just did whatever he wanted. He was kind of like that bad child that you have who just does whatever but you just can't really control him but he sometimes does he just does enough to answer to your to your authority so you don't like feel a need to you know destroy him or kill him um but at the same time you're usually just kind of like come on Mahmoud, would you stop like being such a bastard but nonetheless that's that's kind of how he was but the sultanate of delhi 
um, basically Mahmud's group, ruled India to varying degrees of success for roughly 320 years, um, 1206 to 1526 CE. Pretty weak administrative structure. Basically, they just kind of depended on assorted Hindu kings to sort of agree with what they did. And if they'd agreed, great. If they didn't, they really didn't have much to do to keep them in control. And we see in some dynasties, yes, they were able to control most of um, India, but in other ones, you, you made pretty much just the north. Usually controlling the south was the hardest part um, for assorted Indian leaders trying to control everything. Um, but in southern India, we see Hindu kingdoms still remain in charge. And this conflict between Islam and Hinduism is a common theme we will see in India for a long time. Um, pretty much it's still going on today. The country of Pakistan is kind of living proof of that because Pakistan is a Muslim nation. And basically that's where the Muslims in India go live. Whereas if you're Hindu, you live in India itself. Um, with exceptions. There are Hindus that live in Pakistan and there are Muslims that live in India, but by and large, it's separated like that. But way before this, um, in the post-classical period, we had in the south the Chola Kingdom, which was not really so much a centralized state as it was a confederation of sort of trading ports. Um, it was more of a maritime confederation than anything else. And it was not really centralized. And it was just basically a loose agreement of these trading cities to sort of keep nice with each other so that they could continue trade. Um, and then we will see later on the Chola would be sort of eclipsed um, over a long period of time, we're talking hundreds of years, by the kingdom of Vijayanagar, that's how you pronounce that, Vijayanagar, um, which established in the mid 14th century and continued on until about 1565. Um, it started in the North Deccan Plateau, um, which is sort of the northish part of India. Um, originally, it was supported by the Sultanate of Delhi. They sent two brothers down to sort of uh, expand control of the Sultanate, um, and the brothers' names were Harihara and Buka. Um, but interestingly enough, they kind of double-crossed the Sultanate of Delhi. Um, they actually reconverted to um, Hinduism and renounced Islam. However, they were able to keep good relations with the Sultanate. They basically went down there to expand the Sultan's power, and they basically said, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep this for ourselves. And for whatever reason, the Sultanate didn't really have much he could do because they really didn't have a whole lot of control, just like they didn't have control over the Hindu leaders in the north, and they just kind of had to deal with it and just kept mostly positive relations with the um, kingdom of Vijayanagar um, to the south. So. We see some semblance of control in the South, but not really, more of just an agreed uh, sharing of power. And here we can see, so the Deccan Plateau is sort of this flat area of India. Um, the India is interesting in terms of geography in that they have these string of mountains sort of lining the coast called the Western Ghats to the west and the Eastern Ghats, G-H-A-T-S, to the east. And obviously up here, we have massive mountains called the Himalayas that make it really impossible to move um, across. And then we have the Hindu Kush mountains at the top as well, which makes it even, well, pretty difficult, um, not as difficult as the Himalayas, but obviously the White Huns are able to get in through the Khyber Pass, so um, it's not impossible. But we see Harsh's kingdom up here. We see the Sultanate of Delhi at about 1300, but we realize that they were able to push all the way into the south for brief moments. The Chola kingdom at about 1050, and the Vijayanagar kingdom in about 1500. So again, never really a unified state. Very different from Rome, very different from China, um, and it's very much an exception um, in terms of sort of post-classical statehood. Actually, in a lot of ways, though, a continuation um, in that we see trade sort of being the unifying theme more so than a political statehood. But in terms of economics and agriculture, um, in India, they live in a monsoon world. Monsoon means season, and they have very different season from spring and summer to fall and winter. In the spring and summer, in parts of India, that's when you get your rain. 
So basically winds push from the southeast um, and, or sorry, southwest, and they push up through India and they bring the rains. So they get a ton of rain. It's some places just rains nonstop. But then starting in the fall, the rains stop because the winds shift. Now they blow from the northeast. They blow over the Himalayas. The Himalayas stop a lot of the rain. And because of that, your rain only comes one time a year. And your ability to predict and control the flow of water, because sometimes the rains start early, sometimes they start late, sometimes you don't get as much rain as you thought you would, sometimes you get way more, way much more rain than you thought you would. Sometimes that can cause your crops to completely dry out. Sometimes it can cause them to flood. Um, India has a long history of trying to deal with these variant issues in terms of rainfall and famine is a common theme we see in India, kind of like what we see in China. Um, in which the weather can be really, really, really nasty and, and non-conducive to sustaining a large population, which India has. Um, this is a better map that shows that, but in addition to dealing with agricultural issues, um, we also see that is a huge issue in terms of trade, um, because basically when you sail with your goods to India and you unload your cargo and trade, you kind of have to wait a couple of months till the winds change, and then you can go back to wherever you came from, which in most cases was maybe Eastern Africa or up in the Red Sea into um what is now the Suez Canal and maybe back to Europe. Um, in all likelihood, you're probably coming from um, the Arab world, the Islamic world, which is where most traders came from. Um, but to deal with these variants of rains, um, the people of India got very, very adept at building reservoirs, which is basically a man-made lake, canals, which is basically a man-made river, as well as tunnels to sort of store water and keep water so that you have this nice reservoir or like sort of lake of water to use to water your crops. So you always have sort of this reserve. We kind of see in the word reservoir, the word reserve, and that's not an accident. Um, the Indians got really good at that. And because of that, they didn't have to really rely on favorable rainy seasons. They always had a steady supply of water. And that's crucial because of that, they're able to grow crops more efficiently and with more food comes more people because more people have food to eat. They're healthier. They live longer. They live long, long enough to have babies and those babies have babies. And we see the population just about double from 600 CE to 1500 CE. And this is kind of a common thing during the post-classical period. In a lot of places we see populations boom and grow, but not in Europe. And we'll get to that when we get to chapter 16. In terms of trade and economic development, um, we see that Indian um, regional economies were pretty self-sufficient. They were able to keep food for themselves pretty well. Um, and a few products were traded throughout the subcontinent, like iron, copper, salt, and pepper. Um, easy to do because none of those things spoil. And Southern India definitely had a massive trade advantage because one, they're on coast so they can connect themselves to Eastern Africa as well as the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Um, and then also to the East, to places like um, Southeast Asia um, and the kingdoms of Srivijaya and Angkor, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but also they profited greatly from political instability in the North. In the North, they were never able to have a politically stable enough environment to really engage in trade. They were too all, they were always busy trying to sort of take over one another and fighting each other, and they weren't able to focus enough on sustaining themselves in terms of trade. And, and the Southern Indians never really unified, but they never really fought each other either. They were all kind of cool with each other and just sort of did their own trading things and didn't really bother one another. It was a confederation. So while the North India, Northern part of India was completely unstable, the Southern part was reaping all the benefits from that instability to the North. So just remember, unification um, does not necessarily necessitate stability. And though the South was not really unified politically, they were unified economically in that they all had this sort of agreement to keep things nice so that they could maintain trade, which they benefited from in that regard.
In terms of society, um, temples were much more important than just religious centers. It wasn't necessarily just a place where you went to practice your religion. It was also a place where um, you sort of got a lot of your most important economic elements in terms of coordinating irrigation and sort of telling people what they needed to do to sort of plant their crops and manage their water supplies in order to um, grow food most efficiently. Um, some temples were very, very wealthy in that they held a lot of land, were able to collect sort of taxes from those who um, worked on it. And they also were centers of learning. That's where you went to learn how to read and understand the doctrine for your religion. And it also provided banking services. They could give you a loan, so to speak, if you wanted to start some sort of trading venture or something like that. So in a lot of ways, they were like economic centers, not only cultural centers as well. Um, and we see an increased amount of cross-cultural trade in the Indian Ocean Basin, where India was trading with Southeast Asia, with Eastern Africa, with the Arabic world, with the Islamic world, um, even with China to a degree. Um, and there's much greater organization of agricultural ventures. And we see the establishment of emporia, where you have these sort of very cosmopolitan port cities. Cosmopolitan basically means you have a whole lot of different types of people living there. An example of this would be like New York City in the United States. Um, if you ever go to New York City, you'll see people from all over the place. You'll hear so many different languages. I highly recommend going to New York if you can, but bring a nose plug because it stinks. New York stinks. They don't have any alleys. They don't have that so they just put all their garbage on the sidewalk and if you go in the summer it smells like basura it smells like trash garbage okay um but i digress indian port cities were known as emporia so basically a lot of people coming together to buy stuff to sell stuff traders living there and it could be sometimes kind of a wild place you have people out on the road and you know they want to unwind and there's probably a lot of drinking and gambling and all sorts of other sinful activities that I can't bring up in a high school class, but I'll let your teenage imagination sort of go with it where you will. Um, and we see the highly specialized products developed, especially cotton and high carbon steel, as steel becomes more and more of a product used because it's very durable um, and it's highly lightweight compared to something like iron. Um, and of course, spices as well. Um, but moving along, we see in addition to this, the Kingdom of Aksum in Eastern Africa. Um, it was an area pretty much driven by trade, and that trade was with the Arabic world, or the Islamic world, as well as the Indian world. It was found in the highlands of what is modern day Ethiopia, and interestingly enough, they adopted Christianity. It's called Coptic Christianity, and it's still practiced in a large degree today. Um, even though that area is pretty heavily Muslim, there are pockets of Christians that live there. Um, the African kingdom of Kush was basically displaced by the kingdom of Aksum, and it became the Egyptian link to the south. So basically, they were the link from Egypt to the south and became the major trade port. Um, they actually fought and destroyed the Kushan capital of Meroe in 360, and they became the dominant area in southern eastern Africa, Kingdom of Axum. And we see a lot of interesting interpretations of Christianity, which was not like what we saw in Europe and is not like what we see in Eastern Europe, which we'll look at later in the next chapter. <coughs> Sorry, I got a cold if I'm coughing. In fact, I'm going to have some tea. So that brings us to caste, Islam, society and culture in South and Southeast Asia in the post-classical period. Oh, that's better. And as I mentioned before, even today in India, we see conflict between Muslims and Indians. And throughout Indian history, we see some pretty ghastly and horrific acts of violence in the name of differences between Hinduism and Islam. But um, it all kind of starts around this period, um, this sort of tension and out, out, out and out conflict between these two religions. But before we get into that, it would be wise to review um, caste and Hinduism in India because I feel like we didn't do a 
totally great job of that the first time. Um, so to understand caste, you have to understand four terms. The first is reincarnation, which I'm sure a lot of you already know, but reincarnation literally means to be born again, to be made flesh again. Like think of the word carne in Spanish. Um, it means meat, okay, to be made flesh again, to be made meat again. So after you die, you get born again, but you're not necessarily born a human. You could be born an animal. Um, if you were a bad human, you could be born like a bad animal, like a cockroach and get squished by some fat guy's shoe um, in a bathroom somewhere in a dirty place. Hopefully that doesn't happen to any of us. Um, but what determines how you reincarnate are two things. Your dharma, so your duty in life. So if you are born a rich person, you have to live the duties of a rich person um, and do those things. If you're born a poor person, you're supposed to live the duties of a poor person. And this keeps a very rigid society in India. It's really hard to leave your station in life because you're not supposed to break your dharma because if you break your dharma, you will have bad karma. And bad karma is your punishment for how you didn't live up to your dharma, your duty. However, if you do live up to your dharma, you could have good karma and re be reborn as something good. You could be reborn as a Brahmin cow. In India, cows are sacred. You're not supposed to mess with cows. You're certainly not supposed to eat cows. So if you ever go to India, don't try to order a steak don't try to order a hamburger because people will get mad at you because that's bad. Not supposed to do that. Not supposed to eat cows. Cows are sacred. It's bad. Um, Indians think us eating cows is about as gross as how we think of people eating dogs. You can eat a dog. It's okay to eat a dog. They're perfectly nutritious animals to eat, but obviously we don't because we like dogs. Dogs are cute. Dogs are fun, but you can't you can't eat them here. Like, I think it might even be illegal. Same thing applies in India, but with cows. And cows, you're not, cows just kind of wander around. If a cow gets in front of your car, you just sort of deal with it and hopefully the cow moves. Um, they even like paint and decorate cows um, for certain festivals and religious traditions because cows are sacred. But when you are released from the eternal cycle of birth and death and rebirth, that is known as moksha, where you become sort of one with the eternal and universal spirit. And in terms of how Indians think of gods, um, they look at it 